Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is Sister Sharon, and this is Mass Memorial See Me Sunday School for August 27th, 2023. We are on the last lesson in our summer quarter. The summer is over, at least by our Sunday school lessons. So this lesson is the righteous reign of God. The, the summer quarter is the righteous reign of God. And I gave you this key verse when we started studying this summer quarter, and I wanted to bring it back to you. And that's the 47th division of Psalm verse two that says, for the Lord most high is awesome. And then it says, he is a great king over all the earth, but we know he is the great king over all the earth. So that's a verse to just remember, for the Lord most high is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth, Psalm 47, two. We're on unit three, God's eternal reign. Today's lesson, total power. Our key verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 28, that says, now when all things are made subject to him, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And then our lesson scripture is 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. So we were in 1 Corinthians in a previous lesson. I gave a lot of background. So today I cut the background. We still have a lot of scripture because it's a very serious topic. But I cut the background because hopefully we remember a lot about 1 Corinthians. But just to do a little background, 1 Corinthians was written by Paul. His Hebrew name was Saul, which is possibly named after Israel's first king. His Roman name was Paul. He was born a Roman citizen. He was born at Tarsus in Cilicia, which is located in current Turkey. He was a tent maker by trade. He was an apostle to the Gentiles. He was a defender and advocate of the Christian faith. And he wrote 13 letters presented in the New Testament. And of those, um, one of them is 1 Corinthians. And then also he had three great missionary journeys. And we can see that in Acts. Now, today we're studying 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, part of that chapter. And so these are the subtopics that are in 1 Corinthians 15. We see the risen Christ face reality the risen Christ, our hope, the last enemy destroyed, effects of denying the resurrection, a glorious body, and the last topic in that chapter, our final victory. So I encourage you that even though our lesson, we're really just looking at a few verses, and we're going to look at a few more for background, that you read the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. So the background scripture, this comes right before our lesson. And so I needed to go ahead and give you that. So I'm going to read that for you. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. And it says, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So we have people saying there's no resurrection of the dead. And if you think back to the groups um, in New Testament times, where we think about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, the Pharisees did believe in resurrection from the dead, but the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection from the dead. So, you know, you would say that's why they were sad, you see. But the idea was they did, they did not believe in resurrection of the dead. But somehow this got into the, uh, uh, the Christian, some of the Christians in Corinth, that there was no resurrection of the dead. Now, then the scripture says, but th if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. And so this is the idea of doing this, um, it's almost like a debate, um, the way he's doing this. And he's presented it in the, he's doing it in the um, opposite way. So he's saying, if this wasn't true, then that's not true, then that's not true, then that's not true. Okay, and so that's how he's doing this as we, um, Paul is doing this as he does the scripture. So again, it says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So he's going backwards on it. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. If in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. It was worthless, okay? You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So he, he's doing this argument going the other way. He said, if we don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, all that we've done is worthless. Okay, we're, 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 we're false witnesses of God. Um, we're still in our sin. 
Um, all those who were in Christ before us have perished. And so, because our belief is that, okay, you know, and that's what we believe on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. And we say it in our uh, Apostles Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And then the Apostles' Creed continues after that. But that's what we say. But they're saying, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then we're still in our sin and we just perish. Okay? So that's what comes right before our lesson. So then our lesson picks up at verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. So in other words, okay, but let's, let's get to the truth. Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Well, and notice I love the way it says asleep. It doesn't really say death. Okay. It says asleep, but the idea is first fruits. So what are first fruits? First fruits refers to the first portion of the harvest, which is given to God. Most notably, the first fruits are the first to come in time, a pledge or hope of the greater harvest to follow, and the first fruits are specially dedicated to God. So if we you look in Leviticus, and we're going to, uh, I have a commentary um, note from Dr. Tony Evans that talks about that. But if you look into Leviticus, it explains that the children of Israel needed to take the first fruits, right? Right when the harvest came up, the very first part of their harvest, okay? And they needed to bring present that to the priest, okay, as an offering to God, because it was the first to come in time. And then they were able to give it away, having faith in God that a greater harvest was going to come. And also this was, it was an offering to God. So it was specially dedicated to God. That's what first fruits um, refers to. So now this verse is saying that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So now let's look more into that. Acts 26, 23 says that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the, here it goes, first to rise from the dead, first fruit, and will proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Revelations 1, 5, the second part says, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the, here it goes, firstborn from the dead, first fruit, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, this excerpt from the Tony Evans Bible commentary says, the use of first fruits here calls to mind Leviticus 23, 10 through 14. So that's the specific scripture. In that passage, the Israelites were to bring the first portion of their harvest to the priest as an offering to the Lord. This was done in anticipation of the full harvest that was to come as they trusted in God to provide. Thus, Christ's resurrection is the promise that believers will one day be raised. He's the first fruit. And those who've fallen asleep because we're asleep in Christ, where um, it's not an eternal death. And death actually means separation. So death would mean like separation from God. And we're not separated from God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So just want to make sure we, we have that clear. There's a physical death, but honestly, death means separation from God. So to be absent from, as Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 in our lesson says, for since by man came death, notice there's a lowercase m, by man with a capital M also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, and that's that lowercase m, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, that's the capital M, all shall be made alive. So let's look at that. We're going to look at the lowercase m-a-n, and that would be Adam. Okay, and we can go all the way back to Genesis, in the beginning, God. But Genesis 3, 17, 19 says, then to Adam, this is after they um, ate, the, um, ate from the tree that they were not supposed to eat from, right? And so they ate, they ate the fruit, okay? And so now God is telling them the consequences. And he says, to, then to Adam, this is God, God said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they ate of. He says, cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. 
In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So we notice here, this scripture from Genesis 3 shows us by man, lowercase m, came death. Okay. By man, lowercase m, that's Adam in Genesis, came death. Because it says, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, going further, if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49, same chapter, but a little bit further, you'll notice that we're still talking about Adam and we're still talking about Christ. So let's look at these scriptures. And it says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, okay, that's Genesis, Adam, became a living being. So he was human. The last Adam, that last Adam, that's Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man, Adam, from Genesis, was of the earth, made of dust. Remember, from dust he came, from dust he will return. The second man, Jesus Christ, is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, okay, we all shall also bear the image of the heavenly man because we have accepted the heavenly man as Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So remember, Christ raised from the dead first. We know that. And then when Jesus comes back, his second coming, then the rest of the harvest will come. Everyone else who believes in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, they will be raised from the dead. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have, again, fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And that's why even at when we have home goings and we know that that person was saved, it's a celebration, it's a home going. And so... Um, we don't sorrow as those without hope because we know that we was, if we believe in Jesus Christ also and they, and they were a Christian, we will see them again one day and they have just fallen asleep. So we don't act like we're hopeless. Um, for sure as there is God, there is hope. So going on from there, verse 14 says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So our loved ones who... Um, knew Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and they passed from this world, they transitioned from this world, they're just sleeping Jesus. And then it says in verse 15 of 1 Thessalonians 4, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. And then it tells us how it's going to happen. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So first it was Jesus Christ who rose. Now the dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, and this is important for us, comfort one another with these words. So again, there's an order to things. Christ was the first fruits. After that, there's the rest of the harvest. And then the order of the harvest is those who are dead in Christ come after Jesus himself. And then those who are alive and remain will get caught up. Okay. Um, now, 1 John 3, 1 to 3, 1 through 3 says this, Behold, what man of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And this is the part I want you to realize. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has the hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So just going back, it says, each of us in this order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. And so we are children of God. And we may not know what we shall be, but we know that um, it will be revealed to us. That's 1 John 3. Now, 
Back to our lesson. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 25 says, then comes the end. And there's a lot in the end. And I, I'm, I'm not going through the whole millennium and, and, and different things like that. And we can read about that in um, the book of Revelation. Uh, it says, but then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the 110th division of Psalm verse one says, the Lord, notice the capital L-O-R-D, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So here is saying that when the end comes, Jesus Christ is going to deliver the kingdom of God to Father God because he would have put an end to every power. Every power would be subject or be under Jesus Christ. Okay. And, and Jesus is going to reign and there's the, the millennial reign and so forth. You can read about it in Revelation, but he said he will, but he, Jesus Christ will reign in that way until all enemies are under his feet. There's a song under my feet, under my feet. Now my victory is complete. Jesus bore principalities, made a show of them openly under my feet, under my feet, but everything's going to be under Jesus' feet. And now 1 Corinthians 15, 26 through 28, and I didn't give subtitles on the other parts this time, but I did say death dies, you all. We need to know that death dies. So it says in verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Remember we read earlier um, from Revelations 21 that there'll be no more death. So the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things, it might be actually the scripture underneath this, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And you might say, whoo, okay, what is that, Sister Sharon? So again, Jesus, will, Jesus is reigning and he will reign till every enemy is put under his feet, till he is in control of every enemy. And the last enemy that's going to be destroyed will be death. Okay. And once everything is under his feet, okay, or under him, that's saying, um, that means he's on the top. Okay. Everything is under him. Then Jesus himself will subject himself back under father God. Okay. So he'll get everything under him, and then he will subject himself. He would have finished what, you know, how Jesus said, it is finished. He would have finished what he needed to do by, de by destroying every enemy and then having them all under his feet. And then he will give back to God. He will subject himself back to God, the father. So it says, because God is all in all. Now, let's look at that a little bit more. Now there's a revelation 21 for us. So remember, it says the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Revelation 21, 4 says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death. See, the last enemy dies, so death dies. Nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall, be, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So Jesus has authority over all that, and all that is under his feet. And death is the last enemy to die. Then with this in mind, this idea of Jesus subjecting himself, it comes from the fact that God had exalted Jesus. So let's look at Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And this is the New International Version. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, and this is at the very beginning, remember in the beginning, um, God created or let us make man in our own image. So Jesus was there with God in the beginning. He says, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. And this is the thing. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. He became obedient to Father God. He humbled himself. 
even though he was basically in the very nature of God, remember it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But Jesus humbled himself and came in the form of a man. Found okay, and he was obedient to Father God, even to death on a cross. Now, verse nine says, Therefore, God, and this is talking about Father God, exalted him, Jesus Christ, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus came in the form of a man. He was very nature God, but he came in the form of a man, and he humbled himself to be obedient to Father God. And because he humbled himself even to death on a the cross, then Father God exalted Jesus. OK, to the highest place, to the point that every knee is going to bow. So all the enemies that see, we we can say they are under Jesus feet or we can say every every one of them enemies, every knee is going to bow. Even the people who believe in Jesus and the people who don't, the, um, the, 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 the devil, the demons and everything else. It comes down to and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as every knee shall bow, it says in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Okay. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. And who gets the glory? God the Father. So he subjected himself. He got all the enemies under his feet. And, and then it says, it's back to you. It's back to you, Abba. It's back to you, Father God. First Corinthians 15, 28 Amplified says this. However, when all things are subjected to him, Christ, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one, the father, who put all things under him. So remember, right in Philippians, we see how God put everything under Jesus, and then Jesus ends up putting himself under Father God. So go ahead, I'm going to read that again. However, when all things are subjected to him, Christ, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one, the father, who put all things under him so that God may be all in all. And this is the our last verse. I'm just got it in Amplify so we can see it better. Manifesting his glory without any opposition, because all the enemies are under the feet, the supreme indwelling and controlling factor of life. So that's our verse from our lesson, Amplified. So we can see that what it means when it says God may be our all in all. Manifesting his glory, that's the weight of his excellence without any opposition no more enemies so in summary now you can look at this summary and say sister Sharon, a summary is supposed to be short <laughs> this is like when um uh, I, I think about lawyers and they say that they're writing a brief and the word brief to me means something short and then a brief is long so i'm giving you all in brief today or in summary we, okay it's really not a summary it's in brief it's kind of long but this just sums it up for me. And this is Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. And this is the contemporary English version. So it just walks us back through what this lesson was basically telling us, everyone. It says, Adam sinned, and that sin brought death into the world. Now everyone has sinned, and so everyone must die. Sin was in the world before the law came. Remember, the law came with Moses, but no record of sin was kept because there was no law. Yet death still had power over all who lived from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. This happened, though not everyone disobeyed a direct command from God as Adam did. In some ways, Adam is like Christ who came later. But the gift of God's undeserved grace was very different from Adam's sin. That one sin brought death to many others. Yet in an even greater way, Jesus Christ alone brought God's gift of undeserved grace, a merited favor, to many people. There is a lot of difference between Adam's sin and God's gift. That one sin led to punishment. But God's gift made it possible for us to be acceptable to him even though we had sinned many times. Death ruled like a king because Adam has sinned. 
but that cannot compare with what Jesus Christ has done. God has treated us with undeserved grace and he has accepted us because of Jesus. And so we will live and rule like kings. Remember, we're a holy priesthood, royal nation. Everyone was going to be punished because Adam sinned. But because of the good thing that Christ has done, God accepts us and gives us the gift of life. It's a gift. We have to accept the gift. Adam disobeyed God and caused many others to be sinners. But Jesus obeyed him and will make many people acceptable to God. Finally, it says, the law came so that the full power of sin could be seen. Yet where sin was powerful, God's gift of undeserved grace was even more powerful. Remember the name of the letter, le lesson, total power. Sin ruled by means of death. And then finally, but God's gift of grace now rules. And God has accepted us because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Everyone, this means that we have eternal life. When we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, because of God's gift of undeserved grace, this means that we have eternal life. Jesus put all the enemies under his feet, total power, and then subjected himself to the Father, total power. This is our lesson. This ends our summer quarter. The righteous God reigns. Be blessed. Love in Christ, Sister Sharon.